Perfect. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, so uh, just to reintroduce myself. So I'm Yazan. I'm one of the founders of QuestMed. Um, I'm taking over from uh, Prakar, who unfortunately uh, is late at work, so he can't come. So I gave this lecture actually uh, last year. So uh, and I'm a medical registrar, so I should know enough cardiology to get us through the day. Um, and yeah, hopefully it'll be useful for you. Um, so this is the first uh, first uh, lecture in our final series. So today we're doing cardiology. I think next week we're doing gastro, I think, uh, and then we're doing rest. And then I think we're doing uh, uh, gynae as well. And then we're going to do some more in February for those who have finals afterwards. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's useful. Uh, we're going through lots of questions. Some of them will be very hard, the questions. Some of them will be a bit easier. But I'm just trying to use a lot of these questions as um, sort of uh, help for you to understand the rough idea in terms of what the core knowledge is and what the sort of nice to know knowledge is. Um, sorry. Cool. Very good. Um, it's fine. So um, just to tell you, so a lot of these questions are sort of finals type questions. Um, if you're a QuestMed subscriber, um, we recently launched our mock test feature which is very, we've been working on for quite a while now. Um, so we have about uh, 300 question finals mock tests that try and simulate the exam scenarios that you have. Um, so you can access it by going onto the left-hand sidebar. There's two core clinical mock tests, so 50 questions each, uh, which give you an understanding of the core stuff you need to know. And then we also have uh, five PSA questions, PSA mock tests as well, to help you get through uh, the PSA exam to prepare. Um, and we think they're the closest thing that are uh, that you can get to the PSA uh, when it's written between senior doctors and junior doctors. So um, hopefully it will be relevant for you. So um, yeah, and if you've tried them already, uh, let us know. Uh, very interested to see what you guys think because it's a very new feature. Cool. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so what we're going to do today, we're going to do some cardiology, do some questions and do some polls and see what everyone thinks. Uh, we're going to analyze the clinical vignettes to give you an understanding of how to uh, go through these sort of questions and then go through the relevant core material after each section. Cool. So we'll start off with a question, lay answer it for a bit, pop up the poll, and then we'll go through it in more detail. So uh, let's start off with the first question. Um, so what we'll do is we will give you, uh, I think it was a minute we normally do, right? Yeah, okay. So give you a minute now to go through. Uh, and then uh, we'll pop up the poll sort of 30 seconds after it's there now anyways for now. Um, and then we'll go from there. Okay. All right, guys, let's see what people think. Um, so what's our answer? So 69% have gone for unstable angina. Okay, so let's go through the answer. So what's the correct answer? The correct answer is indeed unstable angina. So now let's go through the clinical vignette in a bit more detail to understand why the answer is unstable angina. So this gentleman has come in with a severe central chest pain, 60 minutes. Um, but the most important thing in this case, uh, from a sort of symptomatology perspective, is this at rest. Um, improved when he was given GTN. Um, and on the ECG, there is some T wave inversion and leads one AVL V3 to six. Uh, however, the troponins are normal. So severe central ch chest pain doesn't help you that much. Um, it helps you to say that it's ACS, but it can also be pulmonary embolisms, aortic dissections. Um, lots of really obscure diseases, as we've put on here. The improvement to the GTN sort of helps to a certain extent to, to put it down to ACS. Um, but really, it's the, um, 
It's the T-wave inversion, which suggests there's evidence of ischemia. However, this could all be old, of course. Um, but the fact that he has chest pain at rest really sort of puts you towards the fact that this is an ACS, acute coronary syndrome picture. However, the serial troponins are normal. This favors an unstable angina type picture over a N-STEMI per se. And we'll go through what the differences are in a bit more detail. So going through the choices themselves, um, it's, it's not a ST elevation MI um, because there's no ST segment elevation. Um, and there is, because it's, uh, there's no troponin rise, it is not, a, not N STEMI, uh, it's not considered to be an MI per se. Um, it's not a stable angina because it's at rest rather than exertion, which shows you the importance of this distinction. And finally, myocarditis, um, you might expect some breathlessness, maybe some heart failure, possibly not always. Um, it actually can be very difficult to distinguish between them. But the fact that it's a very short history is less likely. And also you may hear sort of evidence of someone having a viral infection of some sort, which may be a cause of myocarditis. So in terms of the mechanisms of ACS, um, you have sort of, as I said, sort of different uh, categories, the unstable angina, the NSTEMI and the STEMI. Um, unstable angina tends to be this sort of transient ischemia that doesn't lead to infarction. Whereas with an NSTEMI, you do get some um, ischemia, you get some damage, um, and uh, it can cause infarction. And uh, this could be related to a number of things. So it could be stenosis, could be plaque rupture, rupture it could be lots of sort of aggregation of platelets. Um, and then, it, however, in, in a STEMI, you get this sort of infarction of the whole wall of the heart and uh, usually secondary to uh, vasoclusion, proper plaque rupture or thrombus formation. Um, not so relevant a lot in the finals, to be honest, in terms of the mechanisms, but it's good to understand the sort of slight distinction between the three. Um, in terms of history and examination, I think we should fairly be aware of the different uh, symptoms that we find, a very classical uh, heart, chest type, sorry, cardiac type, chest pain, left neck into the jaw, retrosternal crushing, um, made better by uh, opioids and nitrates. Um, so the symptoms sometimes can't be very distinguishing in terms of the causes um, of uh, acute coronary syndrome. Um, the ECG is very helpful. Uh, so the in unstable angina, uh, you can also get ECG changes. Um, and equally, the same thing goes for an NSTEMI. The difference between them is really the troponin. Um, whereas, and the main distinction between an NSTEMI and a STEMI uh, is really the ST elevation. Um, however, the only distinction, the only caveat to that is that if you have a new onset left bundle branch block, then that can also be um, a, a ST elevation MI. Very difficult in clinical practice because you have patients who have never seen a doctor before and they have left bundle branch block, which there could be just ischemia that's been going for a long period of time. So if you can't compare it between a previous ECG, it can be a bit difficult. Um, so you really, the next step really is to do an echocardiogram to see if there's any evidence of any uh, regional wall motion abnormalities, which may indicate some ischemia or infarction. Um, the cardiac biomarkers, um, in the past, we used to use lots of different ones. So uh, older textbooks will tell you about uh, uh, CK increasing kinase, uh, I think, which I've never uh, really used. Um, but there's basically a troponin, um, and it can be elevated at um, sort of even within a couple of hours of the chest pain. So in my hospital in South London, we use the uh, due to prone two hours and then three hours and then six hours. They're very, very sensitive and you can really see what's going on um, in the heart in terms of the ischemia. Although obviously you can have false negatives. Um, so patients with renal failure, for example, can have a high troponin. So it's all about trying to see what the trend is over time and it can sort of go up and then go down. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very, very sensitive assay. Um, in terms of the um, sort of ECG changes in terms of what you look at, this is a, hopefully a handy table in terms of where you're looking at um, in terms of the ECG. So if it's uh, in, I'll just, if you can see my mouse here, so two, three in AVF, that's an inferior uh, heart attack or MI, uh, and that is caused by a lesion to the RCA. You can get septal, which is V1 and V2. You can get anterior, which could be V3 and V4 or V1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, apex, um, V5, V6, we sort of consider this a lateral, um, a lateral uh, MI. Um, in addition, you can get them in the 
uh, one and AVL as well, which can also be lateral. Um, and then if you get ST depression in V1 to 3, that could be a posterior lateral MI, which is sort of ST depression in V1 to V3 could be a posterior lateral STEMI because it's sort of the opposite way around, if that makes sense. And that could be either RCA or the left circumflex, that's CX for circumflex. And uh, this is taken from our uh, quest book of notes, so you can have a look at it uh, later on. Good. Um, so with heart attacks, you would uh, treat with oxygen um, you, if they need it, only if the SATs are less than 94. You'd give aspirin 300 milligrams, and you could pain relief in the form of um, GTN, glycerol trinitrate spray, IV morphine, sometimes if they're in a lot of pain. And then most of the time, at least in my hospital uh, as well, we give a second antiplatelet um, for patients who are higher risk, such as, so we either give a clopidogrel or ticagrelor, both of which are antiplatelets. Um, and we also give um, fondoparnix uh, or low molecular weight heparin, which has added sorts of antiplatelet effects. And then usually uh, we would discuss with the cardiology doctors uh, and try and get a coronary angiogram. However, if they have a ST elevation MI, a STEMI, we would try and consider um, whenever possible uh, a primary PCI within 12 hours of pain onset, um, ideally within two hours of presentation. And we, sometimes we consider thrombolytic therapy, um, but uh, really PCI is the sort of mainstay for an ST elevation MI. Uh, long term, usually we keep patients or patients on aspirin, atorvastatin, uh, antihypertensives, um, diabetic medications, ACE inhibitors, and beta blockers will usually feature, and of course, lifestyle um, risk factors. Uh, common questions in exams, uh, not so much actually these days, to be honest, maybe sort of, uh, but it is asked a lot, uh, and people worry about it, but just it's a simple thing to know if you... Uh, if you're ever asked is that if someone does have an angioplasty, uh, you, they don't need to drive for one week, but if it's not done, it's one month. That's the distinction. Cool. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next question. So you have now uh, a minute um, to go through stuff. Okay, let's see what the answer is or what people think. Okay, so we have a fair split with this. I think this is a very difficult question. Um, I mainly use this to um, sort of teach a few points. So don't worry if you got this wrong. This is a very, very hard question. So 36% have gone for A, 23% have gone for B, and 26% have gone for C. So yeah, again, don't worry. It's just um, illustrating some, some points so that you can sort of think about this in a bit more detail later on. So uh, let's go through a bit more detail. So what's the actual correct answer? The actual correct answer is C. Um, so let's go through a bit more detail. So you've got someone who, um, we can go through actually the next slide, which has a nice vignette that uh, Prax has made us. Um, so he's got, my, uh, an MI and he's short of breath and he has some malaise. Um, it's five days after, which is very important to know the time frame after which um, what symptoms happen after an MI. There is a parasternal thrill with a harsh pansystonic murmur. The JVP is raised. There is bipedal pitting edema. So uh, these are the things that we think about five days after MI. Is it a mechanical complication? Is it a papillary muscle rupture? Is it a, a ventricular septal rupture? A left ventricular free wall rupture? Lots of different types of ruptures, as you can see. Um, really, the, um, the, the parasternal thrill and harsh pansystonic murmur in the left sternal border is more likely consistent with the VSD. Uh, if we were to have a sort of um, the papillary muscle 
rupture, rupture, you'd expect it to be sort of more in the apex rather than the left side. Again, it's very difficult in clinical practice to actually distinguish between the two. So again, this is again slightly academic because we're trying to sort of, you know, you're not going to distinguish them really if it's a sort of um, you, you you would do an echo anyways, uh, or cardiologists do an echo. So it's not really going to distinguish. But I just wanted to sort of illustrate some points really in terms of how to differentiate between some complications. Um, and then if you look at the other stuff, um, raised JVP could be secondary to a tamponade, which is not a very particular distinguishing factor. And finally, bipedal pitting edema can be related to um, sort of can be related to tamponade, but can also be related to acute heart failure. So having discussed all that, we go through again in a bit more detail. So papillary muscle rupture usually is to mitral regurgitation. So if you just sort of think of core principles, mitral regurgitation usually is a pansystolic murmur heard loudest at the apex. So in this case, it's not, um, not really heard at the apex in the left sternal border, it's a bit different. The free wall rupture is basically, again, logically speaking, you'd expect the patient to basically have a hole, not even a hole, but just a ruptured heart. So you'd expect them to be sort of peri-arrest um, in this uh, sort of in cardiogenic shock. So uh, that you wouldn't really be consistent with that. Uh, and again, here we talked about the interventricular septum. So basically you have a, a hole in the septum. So you get sort of this pansystolic murmur of ventricular septal defect, um, which um, along the left sternal border. Um, so the, 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 one of the most important really points of this question as well is to sort of tell you again that in terms of after an MI, there are, you do get things like um, pericarditis, such as Dressler syndrome, which you might have heard. This typically presents about two to six weeks after an MI. So five days is very important. So I think when you're looking at questions, generally speaking, um, in cardiology and neurology in particular as well, it's very important to know the time course because that really helps you to distinguish between different questions. And finally, the cardiac conduction system. Yes, you can have lots of arrhythmias after an MI, such as ventricular tachycardia or bradycardias, for example. Um, however, um, in this case, you know, there's so much other stuff going on, so it's less likely, um, although it could be. But yeah, there's other stuff going on. So... As you can see, there are loads and loads of complications. Um, I've just list, listed them all here for you. There is, I think, Praxis kindly made us a mnemonic. Yes. Uh, so, uh, death passing Prade Street, which apparently is an imperial by Imperial St Mary's Hospital. Um, so that's Prade Street. Um, so if you're ever in Prade Street, there's a really nice Ethiopian restaurant there. I think. Yeah. So you can go there if you're over there. Anyways, um, so these are the so this is a mnemonic. So death, pump failure, pericarditis, rupture, arrhythmia, embolism, um, and then ventricular septal de defect. Uh, the septal defect is a bit of a cop out for the mnemonic, but uh, bear with me. Uh, but yeah, hopefully this is useful just to sort of distinguish the the differences between them so you don't get caught out. But again, very hard question. Don't worry if you got it wrong. Um, just learn learn from the points raised. Okay, next question. Cool. Okay, guys. So you've got 10 seconds left to answer and see what people think. Do you like my Quest Med mug? If you can see it. Maybe not. Okay. Anyways, cool. Okay, let's see uh, what people think. Um, so people have gone for uh, so C is 35% and then E is 56%. Cool. Okay. So what is the answer here? Okay. So it's revascularization with coronary artery bypass graft. Cool. Okay. So, um, 
uh, I think people are sort of probably figured this out. Sometimes you just need to read one thing in the question, then you quickly realize what the answer is. But this is problematic sometimes because there may be other important things that ask you to weigh different things. But in this case, uh, the real sort of clincher here is the significant three vessel stenosis. Um, so if you go on to the next uh, slide, um, these are the key things. So we have a gentleman with a long-standing history of chest pain, resolves with rest. Um, and it's exertional. So that is a sort of cardiac standing chest pain, angina. Um, and um, he's got a clear cardiac history, not really helping that much with the GTN spray. He's got three vessel stenosis. So all of that, he has sort of reached the ceiling of medical therapy. Although um, it, it, we don't know that for sure, but he's sort of getting there. Um, and then it's really the three vessel stenosis that warrants a a cabbage uh, or a sort of coronary artery bypass graft. Um, so in this case, um, we're looking at stuff. So electrical nerve stimulation, sometimes they use that, um, spit niche. Um, um, it's not really for anginal therapy anyways. Um, oral diltiazem, you wouldn't really convert it with beta blockers or sorry, combined with beta blockers due to the bradycardia. Um, in three vessel stenosis, cabbage is preferred um, rather than PCI. Um, although it can be considered sometimes in high risk patients who won't be able to manage with a with the cabbage, uh, and then this is a an angina drug that's not licensed in the UK. Sorry to those in different countries who are joining us today. May be licensed in your country. Let me know if it's a license in your country. I'm interested. Um, okay, cool. Um, so. Um, yeah, so these are sort of things that we do PCIs for. So we talked about it um, earlier. So STEMI we do, and STEMI. Sometimes we do it for unstable angina, stable angina um, in patients who are very high risk. But really, if you have three vessel disease, um, or if you have quite a lot in your left main coronary artery, if you've got stenosis, um, and so in your um, or in your LAD, then you might consider a, a cabbage um, or three vessel disease. So therefore. Um, this is what we do. And it's one of those things where you sort of read and you're like, oh, yes, okay, three vessel disease, cabbage, cool. Next question. Um, so this is one of those uh, scenarios where, yes, we do consider that, but obviously make sure to always read the question. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. Okay, Brian, you have uh, 20, 15 seconds left now. Cool. Okay. So let's see what people think. Very good. So we have 56% have gone for E and then 20% uh, have gone for A. Okay. Good, so let's go through this. Hopefully this is a slightly more sort of core stuff, generally speaking, sort of questions you might get, sort of um, uh, even in vivas as well, they do ask these sort of questions in vivas. So the answer is indeed E, bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angles. So let's look through the question in more detail. So he's got shortness of breath when lying flat. Um, he has a cardiac history um, and L he has a raised JVP, there's bibasal crackles and there's bipedal pitting edema. Fairly classical congestive cardiac failure, secondary to maybe ischemic heart disease. And there is sort of evidence of right heart failure in the form of raised JVP and pedal edema. There's evidence of left heart, heart failure, pulmonary venous congestion. So together, it's sort of a picture of congestive cardiac failure. Now, um, the other stuff, this sort of water bottle shaped enlarged cardiac silhouette, you can see on this side, that's more consistent with someone who has a tamponade, cardiac tamponade, we'll talk about later. Um, it looks like a water bottle. I think it looks like a water bottle. I don't know what you think, but yeah, I think it does. Don't know what kind of water bottles, old school water bottles you guys have uh, at home, but uh, mine doesn't look like that. And uh, yeah, so the cardiothoracic ratio is more than 0.5 in cardiomegaly um, rather than less than 0.5. 
uh, upper lobe diversion rather than lower lobe diversion. Um, uh, this Fleischner sign, again, the sort of niche thing we whacked in, um, is seen in pulmonary artery hypertension. Um, not very important, but just sort of a bit of a distractor. So really it's bilateral blunting of the costophrenic angles. Um, I think before we talk about heart failure in a bit more detail, this is another question. So we'll go through that. Okay, 10 more seconds to go, everyone. Okay, let's see what people think. Uh, very good. So we have um, the 33% have gone for B, 30% um, have gone for C, and then 70% have gone for E. Um, so the main learning point really from this, to be honest, is just to know what's normal, I guess. That's one, that's probably the most important one. And then the other thing is a bit more niche, which is the sort of cause of this person's possible heart failure. So let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. So the answer is actually C, 60% and normal diastolic fill filling patterns, which is essentially a normal echocardiogram. Right. So, so this patient is a 35 year old female. So um, with a history of fatigue, short breath on exertion, weight loss, anxious and irritable. Um, she has a, a non-tender midline neck swelling, GVP is raised, pitting edema. So basically we're thinking, could this be hyperthyroidism and heart failure together? Um, so kind of could be Graves disease, for example, in this case, and then we're thinking, okay, this is this. So what is the cause of heart failure? One of the causes of heart failure is indeed hypothyroidism. So this sort of high output heart failure where your heart's working really, uh, really hard to get the blood across. However, there's no actual problem with the heart. So if we look at it in a bit more detail, lots of text, I'm sorry, um, but it's just to sort of uh, go through stuff. So um, the first one is you, this is infective endocarditis sort of style. Um, it is, uh, not really likely because there's no fever. There's no new murmur. Um, there's no risk factors we can see. Um, 45% is a bit low in terms of heart, um, in terms of the ejection fraction. So in this case, we would expect high output heart failure rather than low output. Um, and basically, um, remember that 60% of ejection fraction, 60% ejection fraction is actually normal. So that's kind of the key learning points really here as well as the sort of high output stuff we're talking about, which is slightly more niche. Um, so um, regional wall motion abnormalities, we said is a sign of infarction. And then finally, um, the, the last one, again, is a bit niche, this sort of abnormal diastolic filling patterns, which is uh, diastolic heart failure. So it's a bit sort of postgraduate. I wouldn't worry about it. The key points here are this sort of high output heart failure concept and also what is a normal echocardiogram, which is an ejection fraction of 60%. Um, so if you look at it in a bit more detail, um, there are a number of causes of congestive cardiac failure, or um, so uh, you can, or heart failure rather. Um, so you can get ischemic heart disease, uh, cardiac myopathies, um, HOCUM, hypertrophic obstructive cardiac myopathy, especially in the young. Um, and then you can get this high output causes. The most common that we see probably is anemia, um, and also uh, hypothyroidism and pregnancy. Those are probably the ones that I have seen. I have not seen wet berry berry, um, although I have read about it. Um, but the best really is just for the reference. Uh, I've not seen, I've not even seen a patient with Paget's disease before. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, it is a cause. So, uh, but anemia, the one we see frequently is sort of, if you have someone who's got heart failure, long-standing heart failure, and then they are also anemic, they decompensate and they become unwell. 
So basically, we give them a blood transfusion to units, maybe, and then they become a lot better. So that's the most common case that we see really in life. But it's, it's really important to know, but uh, not so much the sort of to regurgitate it, all the all this stuff for medical school, at least maybe for postgraduate stuff. And then you get this sort of New York heart failure classification, which you can see on this left hand side as well. Um, and there are also causes of isolated right heart failure as well, which I won't be really discussing because it's slightly uh, off topic. Um, what we do a lot is uh, we do investigations to see what's going on. So uh, renal profile is important because you're checking for the, uh, to see if the stuff you give like frusamide is going to have any effect um, or any cause any acute kidney injury, troponin for any sort of ACS. BNP is important because it's a measurement. So basically a reflection of um, how bad the heart failure is in, in, pract in practice when you're doing it on the acute medical take. Glucose is important uh, because um, you can have a diabetes, of course, but also there are certain medications that are diabetic medications that uh, have been shown to reduce mortality. Um, so, and these are the sort of SGL2I inhibitors. It's very new. It's only been around in terms of use in heart failure for like a year or two now. We do ECGs, we do echoes, and um, the medications that we give that have mortality benefits include ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, um, and I'm not sure what uh, practice, but ARA here, uh, maybe he means ARB, I think it's probably ARB, so angiotensin receptor blockers, and then loop diuretics give you symptomatic benefits such as frusamide or bumetanide, um, and you can also give uh, interventions such as cardiac resynchronization therapy, which kind of looks a bit like a pacemaker sort of thing um and then uh if they have arrhythmias um you can um you can put an icd a defibrillator cool okay and then this is what we were sort of going on to earlier this sort of abcdef uh, chest x-ray findings and acute pulmonary edema of which uh these are the findings alveolar edema which you can get sort of all these sort of white fluffy bits curly b lines you get these sort of what white lines there cardiomegaly this heart isn't actually that big upper lobe diversion where there's also fluid here at the top you can sort of see there effusions the uh, uh, cost of phrenic angle is not there uh, and then fluid in the horizontal fissure i think you get it basically kind of looks like this yeah that that also is uh, that's the F and ABCDF. Okay, cool. So and then acute heart failure, which you might see a lot on the medical patients and surgical patients. If you give too much fluid, um, is you give them oxygen, you sit them upright, you give them frusamide. Usually, nitrates can help. Um, opioids we don't actually give that often, to be honest. Um, uh, so it's a bit controversial to give uh, opioids. We we do it. It is something that is given uh, or thought and is um used but um i don't we don't usually that use it that much usually uh frusamide and sort of wait and see and then monitor if things are really really bad we could consider things like cpap so continuous positive airway pressure as well nitrate infusions inotropes etc very sort of itu um secondary level two care we call it sort of if people need more organ support so and these patients can be very unwell sometimes okay let's look at the next question Okay, everyone, so you have about uh, 10 seconds remaining. So if we're getting through everything in a bit more detail, um, we're really covering the vast majority of uh, cardiology. So uh, hopefully be useful run through for finals. Good. Okay, let's see what people think. Um, so we have 41% have gone for uh, B and then 29% have gone for C and then 23% have gone for E. Okay, so um, the answer is in fact B. Um, oh, sorry. 
um, and then we'll we'll talk about it because this is this is a fairly guideliney question I think. So, so this is one of the learning points is that some a lot of cardiology and emergency stuff you need to know the guidelines, uh, especially for sort of UK students, but also uh, uh, for other countries as well. Uh, if you are tuning in from other countries, so um, you get this uh, patient who has dizziness, lightheadedness, hypertension. Um, she is the GP has increased dose of metoprolol. But her heart rate is now 30, blood pressure is very low, very bad, uh, sinus bradycardia, We've tried inter intravenous atropine, adrenaline. Um, so probably the metoprolol has caused her heart rate to go down. pre syncope adverse feature. So sometimes you just need to know what the question is telling you. So the question here is telling you this is an adverse feature. Blood pressure, 80 over 45, also an adverse feature. And then we've tried other stuff. Atropine hasn't really worked. Adrenaline hasn't really worked. So really, the only option is going to be pacing. So if you look at the guidelines here, this is for the uh, from the Resuscitation Council guidelines. You try your atropine a couple of times, maximum of three milligrams. If that doesn't work, you could consider either pacing or adrenaline, isoprene, and other stuff. Um, and then um, if that doesn't work, you go for pacing. And you should seek seek expert help unless you can actually pace yourself, which probably you can't. I can't. Uh, so um, yeah. So the only other thing is um, another option. If it was there, uh, if you consider is glucagon, if the bradycardia is caused by a beta blocker, so that's something you can consider as well. Um, but in this case, um, yeah, we would just do some pacing. Cool. Okay. So 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 just looking through, she's got adverse features. We need to do stuff. Um, the cardioversion isn't appropriate because it's just slow. It's not going all over the place. It's not really the first thing to do is permanent pacing. Try sub transcutaneous pacing first, and then um, it, already she has a maximum dose. Again, this is sort of knowledge of the guidelines. So again, this is a guideliney one, um, but also important to have some logic into things as well. Um, good. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. Cool. Okay, so another sort of uh, 15 seconds or so, guys. Um, and if you don't mind um, answering the feedback form as well, please, um, if you're leaving soonish, um, we're very interested to see what you guys think of these lectures. Uh, also, our doctors are on the front line and are taking some time out, even though we're very short staffed. So it'd be very helpful to know what you guys think so we can continue doing these. Cool. Thank you. So yeah, we'll put up the the in the chat the feedback form as well now and later as well. So thank you, Emily. That's all right. Um. Okay. So um. So we get the answer, please, if that's okay. Um. So uh, we got we went between forty two percent have gone for unsynchronized, uh, and then thirty two percent have gone for synchronized. Good. So okay. So we're gonna do some. Uh, this is gonna be important learning points here, which is very. This is an extremely important learning point actually, because uh, you'll face it in the on the wards when you're a doctor. Hopefully you won't be the one doing cardioversion um, unless properly supervised, but it's important to learn the difference between things. So the answer is in fact, unsynchronized DC cardioversion. So let's go through things in a bit more detail now. So um, this patient ha is recovering on the ward from a myocardial infarction. They have palpitations and dizziness and they have an irregular broad complex tachycardia. So what's the next step? So clearly this is bad, cardiac arrest, um, there's no signs of live CPR. Irregular broad complex is ventricular fibrillation. Um, VT is regular um, and uh, asystole is flatline, whereas PA is a narrow complex. In this case, we're thinking this is something that we can shock. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, if we can shock it, is it unsynchronized or synchronized? Basically, if you've got an irregular, something that's just going floppy all over, uh, then there's nothing really synchronized to. So it's an unsynchronized direct uh, current cardioversion. If it was like um, a, a tachycardia that was sort of broad complex and the patient actually had 
a pulse and you could synchronize to something, then yes, that would be a sort of a synchronized cardioversion. But in the arrest situation, if there's nothing synchronized to, it's an unsynchronized cardioversion. Um, otherwise, uh, so adrenaline, you it's a shockable rhythm. So usually just sort of shock and then you give adrenaline, although usually it's sort of three minutes in as well. Um, that's the wrong dose for um, adrenaline. That's the anaphylaxis dose. It's very important to know the difference between them. Um, so it's one in a thousand. Uh, whereas the other one is one in 10,000 IV. And then um, also, yeah, you need to shock because it's a shock algorithm. Good. And this is the resuscitation council guidelines. Again, one thing I would, would remind you all to read thoroughly, memorize thoroughly, no other way around it really. So yeah, you sort of, if it's shockable, you shock them, then you sort of go around into the cycle again. You give them adrenaline every three to five minutes. If it's not shockable, you just give adrenaline. And then after three shocks, you give amiodarone and then you sort of go from there and then you rule out irreversible causes. And there's other fancy stuff you can consider, but that's sort of general principles they need to know at your stage. Okay, let's look at the next questions. Okay, you have 15 seconds left, everyone. Good, good, good. Okay, so let's see what people think. So we got 50% that have gone for intravenous magnesium sulfate, and uh, and then 42% have gone for amiodarone. Okay, so um, let's see what people think. So the answer is uh, B, magnesium sulfate. Um, so what have you got? You have got someone with, okay, so it's a sort of a nice uh, spread. So palpitations and malaise, the patient has amitriptyline. Okay, so that is a sort of risk factor for maybe a TCA overdose, causing an arrhythmia maybe. He's also had a lower respiratory tract infection. Could be maybe given the clarithromycin, which can uh, sort of inhibit, um, is it an inhibitor? I can't remember. I think it's a... Uh, I think it's an inhibitor, yeah, and it leads to sort of more amitriptyline in the body, and therefore it can cause arrhythmias. And really, the, the, the big thing here is this polymorphic. Polymorphic, if you read polymorphic white complex tachycardia, you're really thinking, is this torsade de point, which is a very specific type of VT, which occurs secondary to long QT, which could be secondary to amitriptyline, and of which the uh, treatment is, in fact, um, magnesium. Or if it was a VT, probably would consider amiodarone. This is sort of this polymorphic. Um, you get these, these runs of uh, VT right here. Some these are, these are fine, but it's over there. Um, and then that is sort of torsade de poix. Um, the learning point here again is long QT syndrome. So you can get a lot of really random. Uh, disorders um, that are congenital, but uh, commonly it's mainly electrolyte abnormalities. We can also get it after cardiac arrest, and all, and really uh, it's about drugs as well. It's particularly some of the psychiatric drugs, antipsychotics, tricyclic. So anyone who's got an overdose, they need to have an ECG. Very important, and you need to also check ECGs before you start patients on these drugs as well, and later on. Um, so yeah, in this case, the sort of fiber question would be: How would you manage? These are the sort of things you might consider. Um, and then uh, generally speaking, as I said amiodarone would be for VT as well. And then there's other sort of narrow complex tachycardias, which you might consider giving adenosine uh, for. So um, I won't really talk about this uh, at the moment, but just important to sort of review this again for your own learning. Uh, but there is an algorithm in the resource council which you can look through. Okay, so let's have a look at this question.
Okay, so I'm not going to give you too much time on this one, guys. So I'll give you another sort of 30 seconds or so. Well, the people asking for the recording, it's going to be on our um, YouTube channel. Um, I think this is the link. Maybe. So yeah, all, all our lectures are on our YouTube channel, by the way. Um, sorry. Or Emily, if you have it, uh, could you put up the, the link to the YouTube channel if possible when you get a chance? Thank you. Uh, I don't think this bit.ly link is going to work. But yeah, anyways. Um, so 58% um, have gone for B, and then we have 21% have gone for A. Um, okay, uh, so let's go through the, the answers here. So the answers is quiet heart sounds. Okay, so what are we talking about here in this case? Um, so we have someone who has a stabbing, which is in any case, very high risk for any sort of problem with the chest, like a pneumothorax, hemothorax, you know, a, a cardiac tamponade. The clear chest makes it less likely there's a sort of a hemothorax or something going on in that context. So we're thinking maybe it's in the heart itself. And then there's this concept called Beck's triad, which is um, hypotension, a raised JVP, and quiet heart sounds. And also in this case, they has two of three. Um, so we're thinking, okay, if we listen to the heart, it could be quiet as well. Interestingly, I saw a patient like this on my medical ward cover as an SHO, um, randomly just became really unwell. And I couldn't, it was very strange because I couldn't feel their pulse. And I was just thinking, why can't I feel their pulse? It's so strange because they're fine an hour earlier. And basically what happened, the patient had sickle cell um, and they were on, I think they had a previous clot and they were on uh, Pixaban or Viroxaban. And they just had a big sort of hemopericardium causing tamponade, which is sort of out of the blue. Um, and he was, we couldn't get a blood pressure. We couldn't get a pulse. Um, and, um, and he had sort of quiet heart sounds and, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was very strange, not so common, I guess, but it's important to sort of recognize if you see it. Um, so in this case, yes. Um, there are some other features that you see, um, pulses paradoxes. I don't really want to talk about it. It's not that important. I think for your stage and equally Kuzma sign failure of the JVTP to fall appropriately. This is all stuff you sort of see in ITU on the waveform. So probably I'll just leave it here for reference so you can have a look later. Uh, and then the cardiac tamponade, really, you get this sort of, some people call it a boot-shaped heart. Some people call it this, I think we talked about earlier, the water bottle-shaped heart, if you have that sort of water bottle. And the management really is pericardiocentesis, where an experienced operator um, will put a needle into the heart. And uh, not into the heart, sorry. Definitely not into the heart, into the pericardium. Uh, and then uh, try and extract the fluid to relieve pressure of the heart. Um... Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, this was meant to be earlier. Um, just the other stuff we talked about. So pulses alternus is we get um, alternating strong and weak heart uh, beats. Um, it's a sign of advanced heart failure. Talked about tamponade. S3 is usually sort of volume overload. So lar large volume of blood causing reverberation of the LV. Uh, S4 is a, usually a state of um, a stiff wall. Um, or you get sort of like a, something like hokum, for example. Um, and then a slow rising pulse is more likely in something like uh, aortic stenosis, which you might uh, have come across fairly, very common. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. So I think I was aiming to finish at 7.30, but I think we might run over by about 10 minutes or so, guys, if you're happy to stay. I've got a few more questions to run through. Okay, so give you another 10 seconds or so. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, great. So we have, um, okay, so I think 44% have gone for A and 32% have gone for C. I think maybe perhaps not uh, as many people were able to answer the question, but that's fine. We'll talk about it in a bit more detail. So the answer here is in fact, 
C, rheumatic fever. Um, so we'll talk about that, go through the vignette. So we've got a 48-year-old, 48-year-old um, female. Again, it's not, not, not as common that you'd expect for someone to have sort of uh, a murmur, perhaps like an aortic stenosis murmur, a bit young for that, although possible. She's got shortness of breath and cough. She has an irregularly irregular pulse, tapping apex beats in a mid-diastolic murmur. So we're thinking this is probably AF, um, of which a common cause, not a I would say common cause, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll retract that. Uh, in a young person with a mid-diastolic murmur, we're thinking, could the AF be caused by something like mitral stenosis, which, um, again, is something that you can get secondary to lots of things, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then, again, this sort of the, the, it's the sort of tapping apex speeds and the mid-diastolic murmur. Those are sort of characteristic of mitral stenosis. Um, and of which mitral stenosis, if you go back, um, it could be related to rheumatic fever. So that's kind of the, the progressive, the thought process in this context. Um, so mitral valve prolapse, uh, you wouldn't expect these heart sounds. Uh, you'd expect a mitral regurgitation, so pansystolic murmur. Um, Age-related calcification, not likely in her age group. Rheumatic fever, we talked about, can cause mitral stenosis. Atherosclerosis doesn't really cause a murmur in that context. And again, infective endocarditis, again, you'd cause normally cause a pan systolic murmur, secondary to regurgitant murmurs rather than stenosis. Although they can cause stenosis, to be fair. But in this context, I think with the uh, findings, I think we're thinking more likely to be something like rheumatic fever, especially with no risk factors or anything like that. So um, another mnemonic, if you like mnemonics like I do, uh, pirates cause of AF. Um, although I, there's one thing about mnemonics, which is that if you say them in this context, uh, sometimes people will be like, okay, just tell me the top three, for example. If I was to say the top three, I'd say the top cause I've seen is probably number one, sepsis, number two, electrolyte abnormalities, uh, number three, probably alcohol. Um, yeah, I'd say those are the sort of top three that I've seen uh, in my time, rather than saying sort of electrocution and sleep apnea. And uh, well, I feel sleep apnea is common enough. But, you know, uh, so it's important to use mnemonics, but also sort of have a sort of top three in your head when you're doing vivas and things like that for finals. OK, uh, cool. Let's talk about the another question. So I won't give you too much time on this if this is OK. Uh, so I'll give you about 30 seconds for this, if that's all right. Okay, let's see if we blink. 43% uh, have gone for C, and 20% have gone for B, and 90% have gone, 19% have gone for E. Okay, the answer is in fact soft S2. So basically, let's go through it. So severe aortic stenosis. You know, you get this sort of when you when you have aortic stenosis, what you hear on the heart sounds is sometimes you hear this like whoosh dub, and that's the second heart sound. So whoosh dub, whoosh dub. Yeah. If you have very severe heart uh, stenosis, you, the the murmur, sorry, aortic stenosis, the murmur is so loud you stop hearing the dub. So it's just a whoosh, 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 and that's just because it's just uh, the soft F two, which uh, S two, which you get in severe aortic stenosis. Um, the other stuff, chest pain. Um, can occur um, due to severity of aortic stenosis, but it's not sort of a very um, discriminatory uh, relationship between so aortic stenosis can have other stuff. Wide pulse pressure is incorrect because it causes a narrow pulse pressure. Um, reversed S1, it causes a reversed S2 uh, rather than an S1. And then severe uh, AS can actually be quiet. So the loudness of the murmur is not necessarily um, a cause of um, the um, uh, the loudness of the murmur is not necessarily related to the severity of the aortic stenosis, but it's more the fact that the, um, the, 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 the reason you can't hear the S2 is because the murmur is so uh, prominent, I guess, um, or sort of it's, it's so, yeah, it's difficult to say, I guess, in this context, because obviously you can 
it's the loudness of the murmur that is stopping you from hearing the STU, but the loudness in itself is not necessarily uh, related to the severity, if that makes sense. And um, so you still need to do an echocardiogram regardless. Okay, so aortic stenosis. Um, so um, you have clinical symptoms such as chest pain, shortness of breath and a murmur. You get this ejection systolic murmur. Um, you can get aortic sclerosis, which is related to uh, this difference between them is that um, there's no radiation into the carotids in sclerosis. And generally speaking, it doesn't really need any sort of intervention. Um, you get a slow rising pulse, you get a narrow pulse pressure. And again, the soft S2 is a marker of severity. You can also get some other stuff like an S4 and reverse splitting. And you usually do an echocardiogram to see what's going on. And then you can consider doing an aortic valve replacement or a trans aortic. I can't remember what the VI stands for, the TAVI. If someone can put it on to the chat to remind me. I never can never remember what the, I think it's a venographic intervention, something like that. Does anyone know? Remind me. Um, I'll remember it, uh, the, the tabby later on and tell you exactly what it stands for. Um, so that is aortic stenosis. And while we're here, I've just, I'm not going to talk about it just for time's sake. I'll just put it down so you guys can have a look at it later. Again, this is all sort of on our press book anyways. These are some causes of aortic regurgitation where you get an early diastolic murmur. Um, particularly things like morphans, ehlers danlos ankylosing spondylitis, effective endocarditis. And again, just for reference as well, um, mitral regurgitation causes a pansystolic murmur. Uh, there are many causes. We talked about mitral valve prolapse, talked about rheumatic fever, again, can cause mitral regurgitation, but can also cause mitral stenosis. And there's uh, just other stuff as well. Um, and yeah, those are sort of just for reference for later on. Okay, so I think we're probably at our last, there we go. Transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. So we've used the power of the group. Thank you for your help. Excellent. So uh, I think this is one of our last questions. So we'll sort of wrap up, um, hopefully within a decent uh, time frame. So yeah, we'll give you a minute to go through this question. Okay, 10 more seconds to go, everyone. So please put down your comments. Uh, and again, um, if you're leaving soon, uh, please fill in the feedback form so we can see what we can do to improve. Also, people need it for their portfolio as well. Um, if you come to our other events, so please make sure to fill it out so we can keep the good, the good docs lecturing for us. So yes, okay, let's have a look at the answers. Um, so we have 29% have gone for C, and then 27% uh, have gone for E, sort of the rough, uh, the rough distribution. The answer here is increased PR interval on ECG. This is one of those things, again, similar to the sort of three-vessel disease in a cabbage. If you see increased PR interval on ECG, that is bad for the uh, for patients who have uh, infective endocarditis. So we'll talk about that uh, in a second in terms of why. So uh, is there actually a thing? Uh, there? I just want to check actually if, um, so basically increased PR interval on an EC. Okay, so we haven't actually got the slides to, to tell us exactly what it is, but it's fine. So we'll go through it. So blood pressure 90 over 60 is a bit sort of not as helpful, the low blood pressure. In any case, if you have very low blood pressure, you may not want to go to urgent surgery anyway. Uh, broad complex tachycardia, you don't really treat with surgery, you treat medically. So um, the blunting of the costophrenic angle is more for sort of heart failure. If someone we think has an effective endocarditis and heart failure, we treat them medically. And then a complete absence of lung markings on the right side on the chest x-ray, uh, that could be something like a pneumothorax, for example. Again, we don't usually treat the surgery to start off with, we usually put in a chest strain or a, um, or a needle uh, to sort of see what's going on. Um, so the PR interval really is an indication of heart block, 
of which um, is a, 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 a not very common complication, but a very commonly asked about in exams question is that in, in infective enterocolitis, you can get uh, an aortic root abscess. And when you have an aortic root abscess, the, um, the only finding in that uh, for that abscess is actually just sort of first degree heart block, so the increased PR interval. So if you have someone who has infective enchoditis and has got an increased PR interval, you need to sort of have some discussions to see whether or not they may need urgent surgery because that aortic root abscess can uh, sort of spread and be very dangerous. So that's kind of the rough idea behind it. So if you see if someone ever shows you an ECG and it's enchoditis, look at the PR interval. That's a sort of common thing that is asked about, but not so common in real life. Uh, it's very rare. Um, so uh, organisms, um, Staph aureus is now most common um, rather than Strep viridans. The older textbooks will tell you it's Strep viridans. Um, there are other things. Um, so um, Staph epidermidis um, can be related to things like uh, if you have uh, lines or any sort of foreign um, materials in your body. Um, strep bovis can be present in patients with colonic lesions. And that's a sort of classic, again, single best answer question. And then you get other organisms here, the Hashic organisms. So um, what you do is you, you, there are major and minor criteria. The major criteria revolve around having blood culture positives for infective enteritis, whereas imaging is mainly about looking for any vegetation, abscesses, valvular regurgitations, but also you can look at PET CT now as well to help. And then the minor criteria is people who have a predisposition, such as a predisposing heart condition, or um, if they are intravenous drug users, if they have a fever, which again is not very specific, but if they have certain phenomena that are related to infective enchoditis, such as um, Janeway lesions, such as sort of um, Osler's nodes, Roth spots. And also if um, you have... Um, certain evidence that doesn't really meet the sort of major criteria. Um, and you kind of need two major criteria or one major and three minor or all five minor, because sometimes it's not so clear. So that's why they have these criteria. But for our purposes as, as sort of medical students, junior doctors, it's most, very important to make sure you have the blood cultures, you get that echo, and then you sort of discuss it to sort of, sort of more senior level. Um, treatment wise, very variable, usually for a long period of time, four to six weeks. And then generally depends, generally depends. Um, but uh, for staff, we usually give flu clocks. For streptococcus, we could give benzyl penicillin. But it very, very, very much depends on your local guidelines and um, if it's a native valve or MRSA. So, yeah, uh, don't worry about it too much, but just know roughly what we use to treat. Okay, any questions? Please fill in the feedback form and let me.